All right, welcome everybody to Thirsty Thursday. We'll give just a couple more seconds for people to join in on the live stream. And then Christina, if you're here, just give me a wave. Hey, Michael Brown, thank you very much. I'm glad to know that people can see me. That's perfect. That's all I needed. Awesome, moving along. It's a hot one this Thursday, so we're gonna need some nice refreshing cocktails to settle things up a little bit here, make things a little bit more comfortable. Just another 10, 15 seconds and then we'll dive right in. It is hot, Christina, that is absolutely correct. Or hopefully that's a compliment for me, I'll take that too. All right, everybody, we're a minute in, so let's go ahead and dive right in on this Thirsty Thursday. I am Matt Phillips, Tasting Room Manager at Linford Winery in Wheeling. And today we are coming from my kitchen um, where I can make some fun wine cocktails for everybody today. Um, I love wine. Wine is my go-to beverage, but I also do love a cocktail. Generally, a cocktail that's been made for me by a professional mixologist. Um, I have spent over 10 years working behind a tasting bar and I am very much a novice bartender. I very rarely make my own drinks. Um, I rely on other people to make those for me. Um, so pre-pandemic, I would leave work and uh, go to cocktail lounge and just drink these beautiful concoctions that people put together. Um, I realize how easy my job can be when it's really just a question of operating a corkscrew and pouring into a glass. There's more to it, of course. We do have some explanation. We do have some history that we're going to share with you on the individual wines as we go through that. But I don't have to worry about jiggers and shakers and the whole process of getting your drink perfected because our winemakers already did that for us long before I got my corkscrew into that cork. So all are going to be really simple cocktails, all things that you can probably make with things you already have in your um, cabinets at the moment or your refrigerator at the moment. Um, and probably a really good chance I'm going to spill something tonight too. So stay tuned for something really exciting here. As we've gone through, um, when it comes to wine cocktails, um, the most obvious one would be something like the mimosa. Where we're really celebrating the individual wine and just adding a juice component to it. Um, mimosas, spritzers, um, anything you're adding a bubble to. Um, again, you want to put your bubbles on top in this situation. But these are all ones where you're celebrating the wine, but not necessarily all of the nuanced wine flavors. We want to get that little bit of a um, tipsy quality out of it. We want to taste a little bit of that alcohol. We want to get some of the nuance from the wine. But by and large, it's really the spirit of something that's going to be bright, refreshing, and easy drinking. And so to that end, it's all about keeping it simple, getting the best possible ingredients to put in there without making it over the top. And we'll address that a little bit later. Another really easy wine cocktail is, of course, sangria. So you're going to take any white or red wine. You can add more fruit, more sh uh, sugar, booze, fruit, um, something sparkling, anything you'd like to it. Or you can keep it super simple. Go to Linfred and just buy sparkling or sparkling um, sangria blanc and sangria rouge. And it's already made for you. You can doctor that up if you want, but it's as easy as turning a corkscrew and pouring into a glass after you're getting a nice chill on it, of course. You can also play around with um, different ways to just sort of jazz up your basic everyday fruit wines. Um, I find that sparkling waters do really well with our fruit wines because it tones down some of the sweetness and in some cases will cut through um, a little bit of the, um, the tartness or um, the sweetness on the wine by adding that little bit of effervescence. So I love taking our cranberry wine and throwing like a lime Perrier in there. It's a nice way to sort of brighten the flavor, make for a more um, enticing aroma, and then um, it hits your palate and it's bursting with those bubbles, super refreshing, and you're still getting the kick from the alcohol there. Now, if we want to keep it really classy, of course we have my good friend White Claw. So your hard seltzer, um, these are all going to be something that would easily mix in with any of your fruit wines as well. So I think some Sangria Blanc and the Lime Hard Seltzer might be a no-brainer there. Um, something super refreshing, gets you that little extra kick, makes the summer go by just a little bit faster, um, but uh, a nice way to do um, a low-calorie, on-trend seltzer in with your sangria there. Frosé, another opportunity. So I've got my trusty blender here. And so when it comes to frosé, 
I like to keep it simple. I don't want it to get too, um, too icy because if it's too icy, I'm not tasting anything. So I'm just going to take Linford's Rosé, $12 a bottle, easy drinking, can't go wrong with the $12 Rosé. I'm going to throw in some frozen strawberries or raspberries or any red berry that you like. You might want to throw a little bit of ice in there. You can also throw some vodka in at this point, maybe even a little bit of simple syrup if you'd like something a bit sweeter in your Rosé. Whirl it up and then you've got a beautiful icy beverage. Again, I like for a consistency where it's almost um, a graduated. So the bottom looks a little bit more liquidy for my frosé. And then I just really get that top portion that is that sort of crunchy, um, slushy type consistency. Because I still want to taste some of that rosé that's going on in there. So fun one to play around with there. I'll return this. And um, when it comes to cocktails, though, um, we want to think about occasion. When are we going to want to enjoy these cocktails and where do we want to kind of escape to um, if we're not able to go to those places right now? And so when I think about um, a cocktail that I love that is wine based, it is the Kir. So a Kir is a Burgundian tradition in France. Um, you can find it all over France now, but it originated in Burgundy during World War II. And the local priest and also the mayor, um, Canon Félix Kir, created this beverage by taking creme de cassis, which is a black currant liqueur, and then adding um, aligote, um, or a dry white wine to it. We don't have aligote at Linford, so I'm gonna be using our Viognier, because I happen to have that open today, to make a cure right here with you. So I've got my creme de cassis, and when it comes to a cure, you can kind of um, eyeball how much you wanna put into the glass there, because we wanna to try to get some of that, ooh, um, the essence of the um, kind of with the black currant, but it has a blackberry, um, almost winey type nose to it. Nice little bit of sweetness there. And so I've got my little tulip glass and I tend to go on the lighter side for my cure. I want to see sort of more pale blush, but if you want to make it a little bit sweeter, if you want to go a little bit more intense on your black currant, by all means, add a little bit more creme de cassis. And as I'm pouring this, I'm realizing that my creme de cassis is probably a little old because it's, um, it's looking a little uh, brownish today. But um, you roll with it. Um, end of the day, if it smells good, you can go ahead and drink it. It'll be just fine. So the nice thing here is I get that little bit of black currant right off the bat, and then it's refreshed, and the sweetness is toned down by that Viognier. So the little bit of a peachy note to the Viognier. Again, the color should look more like a rosé in this situation. Um, my guess is that my creme de cassis has been sitting here for just a little too long. But still smells good, so I'm going to roll with it. If it smells like something you're going to spit out, just don't drink it. But that one looks maybe not like the greatest. It's not necessarily photo worthy, but it'll get the job done. Um, so there's your Kier. Um, you can also make it a Kier Royale by taking that same bit of creme de cassis and then topping it with sparkling wine or traditionally champagne. Of course, we don't make champagne at Linford, but sparkling brute with a little bit of creme de cassis, gorgeous color, really awesome flavor, and then the bubbles are actually going to help create this really nice bursting aroma of that black currant that you wouldn't have found from the sparkling wine on its own. Even the sparkling rosé doesn't give you quite that same nose that you do with having that little bit of liqueur in the bottom. You can also play around with other liqueurs. Um, I'm a big fan of St. Germain um, or um, elderflower liqueur. There's a really nice floral component to it. And especially with the sparkling rosé where you have some of those kind of cherry notes happening in there, there's a little bit of raspberry. I think the floral would be a really nice way to sort of bring all that together. And again, just a little bit, it's all to your taste, it's all to your preference, um, but you can put those together and you've got a really fun, exciting, easy cocktail. And that's the other thing too. It takes absolutely no talent to be able to pour a little bit and then just top it off with some bubbly or your dry white wine. Now, I think about a Provencal dinner party when I'm thinking about a Cure Royale, but realistically, what do I have on hand at all times? And that is our good friend, Coke. And so I keep Coke on hand mostly for um, cocktail purposes. Um, I tend not to drink so much of it on its own, but I do like it when it's got a little bit of booze into it. And believe it or not, there's actually a cocktail with wine and Coke. Um, this one goes back to the 1970s in Spain and is called the Calimoco. And so a Calimoco um, is 50-50 
red wine, and Coke. So I'm going to take our classic Fred's Red here, and I've got some ice in a glass. It's one of those opportunities where you can actually ice your wine. And I'm going to pour that about halfway up with my red wine. It feels a little bit sacrilegious to start putting your ice in your wine, but when you put the Coke in there, I mean, really, what difference does it make at that point? So um, what I like about this is that we're going to capture some of those caramelly notes from the Coke, and that's going to mix in with the fruitier notes from the wine. And I don't have a swizzle stick, so we're going to use a Sharpie. It'll kill whatever was on the Sharpie, right? Okay. So right off the bat, it smells a little bit like red wine. Even the coloring is going to have sort of a reddish tint to it. And it's nice because it takes down some of the sweetness of the Coke. You get that caramelly note, and then there's this almost um, faint cherry note that's coming through from your Fred's Red. So it may not be the classiest cocktail, but apparently it's really popular with teenagers in Spain. So if you ever want to drink like a Spanish teenager, cheers to that. Okay, it grows on you. It's, yeah, um, maybe not one for every day. Um, so talking about humble ingredients here, um, things that we basically have at access are at our disposal pretty much at all times. Um, you're mixing wines with alcohol or some other sort of component. So this is not the time to play around with your reserve wines. Um, I remember a story from years ago at Linford Wheeling. We had a couple who purchased one of our 1994 Quintessa Cabernets. Um, so Quintessa is a vineyard in Napa Valley um, that only sold its grapes um, to other wineries up until about the mid to late 90s. And so we happen to have four vintages from this vineyard um, that Linford had produced on site in Roselle. And the 94 fetched a $100 retail value. And this is probably a good six, seven years ago. So at this point, the wine, I would say, was roughly 20 years old. And a couple who had been longtime Linford members, um, they went away for the weekend, and their college-age kids had a party. And at the party, they decided to make some sangria. And so they took the 94 Quintessa Cab, and doctored it up with a lot of sugar, some fruit, um, probably Everclear or some other sort of really intense high octane um, alcohol, and um, served up probably one of the most expensive sangrias that you can imagine. Um, this does not celebrate everything that was amazing about that 94 cab. Um, it also, um, I can't imagine, would have tasted that great because at that point the 94 had sort of um, morphed into this... Um, really nice, subtly earthy, low tannin, um, really just velvety palated 20 year old cab. Um, and with the sugar and the alcohol and everything else that was going into the sangria, must have tasted pretty nasty when you break it down because um, that wine wasn't going to be able to stand up to anything else that you were putting in there. So you're just drinking sugared Everclear at this point, um, which I mean, again, to each their own, but not the best use of a 94 cab. So that's where I like to focus in the house wine category. So your Fred's Red, your Vinda City Red, your Sangrias. These are affordable, and it's not that bad um, in the grand scheme of things if you're throwing a little bit of juice or a little bit of booze in there as well. Um, this, that said, this is not an opportunity to use poor quality ingredients. So um, I like to have my base level with the house wines here, um, but the same deal with my alcohol. I'm not going to be putting in my top shelf spirits in with a wine because it's not really celebrating all that spirit has to offer. With that said, I'm also not going to be going for the um, kind of squeezy, um, uh, you know, ten dollar uh, vodka that you can get from the checkout at the gas station. That's also not the perfect opportunity because if that wine is going to give you a hangover or a really nasty headache or not, um, that spirit is going to make you sick to your stomach normally adding wine to it is not going to make that a better situation. So find that mid-level. Find something where um, it's going to have a um, nice flavor profile and it's not going to break the bank for you to make it. If you want to throw some of our cherry wine into your Johnny Walker Blue and think nothing of it, by all means, go for it. Um, if you have those means, I would like to meet you. Um, perhaps apply to be a beneficiary at some point. Um, but we're talking about quality. Um, but not necessarily exceptional quality or going really above and beyond here. Um, this is doesn't have to be sort of laced with gold. Um, the whole idea is just kind of a fun, fruity, 
an exciting opportunity to celebrate wine and spirits together. So let's start breaking down some other spirits here. Um, we've got our good friend tequila. Now, when I was doing my research, um, I came across this red wine and sort of margarita concoction that was called the devil's margarita. And so you basically take a normal margarita, shake it up, serve it in your glass, and then you float um, some red wine over the top of it. So it looks like the blood coming from the devil sort of seeping into the margarita. End of the day, that's not so exciting for me. It looks really cool, but I can't imagine that tasting all that great. Um, so instead, I want to do something that's still going to celebrate the tequila and match wits with it in a way that it might by way of a normal juice or a puree in another circumstance. So enter mango wine with tequila um, or the sangria blanc. Sangria blanc and sangria rouge, by the way, these are going to be one of your sort of get out of jail free cards when it comes to really easy to mix um, and lend themselves to so many different concoctions. It's really up to you to make something that's going to work well and that you're excited about. Um, but still celebrates the tequila in a way. In this case, too, um, I would say you're going to do about a full glass of wine to a shot of tequila, um, which now might be a little late to make the disclaimer. Everything we talk about today, these are stay-at-home cocktails. Um, it's a party in your glass, um, and that glass should be staying in your living room. It should not be going anywhere else for the night because these can uh, get a little intense after a while. Vodka and gin. Um, so vodka and gin, that's usually one of my go-tos, especially this time of year. Um, of course, our friends, the Hoovers, came up with the Linford 75, um, which we have these available in the tasting room and also on our website. You can find the recipe for the Linford 75, um, but it's sparkling rosé, rosé, gin, lemon juice. It's a really fun, refreshing cocktail. Definitely something to play around with. And look, at it's just so beautiful in the glass. Super festive, really good for Instagram. Um, but uh, I also like to play around with our fruit wines when it comes to the martini world. Um, don't get me wrong. I love a good dry gin martini, a blue cheese stuffed olive, um, the kind of thing you would imagine like, um, like a wealthy widow drinking in a hotel bar. Um, that's my brand. But if I want to have something that's going to have a little bit of sweetness to it or a little bit more intrigue and maybe something that's going to be really kind of pretty to look at, we're going to go by way of my good friend, the lemon drop. And so to make this lemon drop a Linford lemon drop, we're going to add some of our raspberry wine. So I'm starting off here with cocktail shaker filled with ice. We've got two shots of lemon juice. I'm going to add two shots of raspberry wine. And you could also do this with cranberry wine. You could do it with blueberry wine. Um, pretty much any of the berry wines I think would work well here. Anything that's going to go well with lemon. And then, of course, oh, the heavy artillery here with our um, vodka. And so this one's going to call for three shots of vodka. Again, stay at home cocktails. Um, see, I'm already spilling. This is why, this is why I don't do this at, at work. There we go. All right. And then now we're going to make some noise and get things shaking up a little bit. Okay, normally 30 seconds, but for the sake of our Facebook Live here, I don't want to waste too much time just mixing up the drink here. But as you can see, really fun, pretty color, almost grapefruity in color, sort of like a sunset, good kind of golden hour cocktail here. And so you smell the raspberry, there's a little bit of that lemon going on, and... It's got some nice tartness to it, and mm, so, so good. There's three shots of vodka and two shots of wine in here, so this one will mess you up, but my word. That's some good stuff. All right, I got to set this down so I don't get distracted. Ooh. Okay, don't light a match around me. because that's... All right, intense. All right, so we're going to come back to gin in a little bit. Um, I've got a fun gin cocktail. Um, that we're going to share with you um, via our Facebook after we're done here today. Um, but uh, rum, you know, we all have one of those spirits that uh, it just did us wrong at one point. 
for me, rum is one of those. Um, but this one, this cocktail I found might actually be something to get me back on track with rum. Um, it's called the Bishop. And um, I'm not 100% sure on the origin of this one. It looks like it might date back to the 1930s and a uh, hotel bar in um, DC. But it is three ounces of rum. I'm gonna take an ounce of red wine and then um, a teaspoon of simple syrup, juice of half of a lime, shake that up over ice, and then serve. Um, so I haven't tried it yet, um, but that is one uh, for maybe some homework on a night when I feel brave enough to tackle rum again. Um, sorry, I had a moment just kind of staring at the bottle and it, it brought me right back to college and it was a mess and best for me to deal with on my own after this is over. Um, whiskey. Whiskey is another one of those beverages that I absolutely love. I have a hard time sort of reconciling putting wine into it, but when we get into the fall months, taking a cinnamon whiskey and some of our spiced apple wine, fall in a glass, it is going to make the whole trick-or-treating process so much easier to put that in a thermos. You can serve it warm, you can serve it chilled, you can serve it room temperature. Awesome opportunity to celebrate all that sort of apple cinnamon spiciness. Super, super delicious there. Another fun thing to do, um, and we always love to talk about sort of what's a way that I can get the wine interpreted where it's not so literal. I'm not just pouring wine into my cocktail. And that is where a little simple syrup comes in. So I made a simple syrup with our classic rosé. So $12 a bottle. I took a cup of rosé, a cup of sugar, and I let those um, heat up together on the stove, stirring in, letting the sugar dissolve, and then um, let it cool. And I made a very exciting um, rosé gimlet with some gin. Um, so this will be available on our Facebook page um, shortly after we're done here. Um, so you can get the full cocktail and kind of a step-by-step -step for making the um, rosé simple syrup. It is the easiest thing to make in the world. It's two things. You put it together, you heat it up, and you've got it. Um, but I'm using a really fun gin here that I got up in Door County, and it's actually distilled from... Ooh, it's distilled from honey. And so you get this faint honey note to it, and then you get the beautiful flavor of the rosé that's sweetened a little bit, um, and then a little bit of lime juice just to brighten up all of the flavors. So when it comes right down to it, the idea is to try to find things that we enjoy, things that we are going to be able to sort of sit back, relax with. There's also no harm in saying, you know what? I don't need a cocktail. I've got everything I need right here with my beautiful wine glass and my Fred's Red. Classic, perfect right out of the bottle every time, and it requires no more skill than being able to operate a corkscrew to enjoy this one. So it's about that time where I am going to be departing for the evening so I can enjoy my wine cocktails because I made quite a few this evening. Um, but I'm also going to be enjoying those cocktails um, while I'm playing some trivia with some friends this evening virtually, um, but also with some snacks here. And so name of the game here with snacks, we're always looking for something that's going to be sort of salty, something that's going to um, make us want to drink a little bit more of those cocktails. Um, so what I have here in a rustic presentation, rustic presentation, by the way, this is one of those words you can use whenever you screw up a little bit or your knife skills aren't so honed. Rustic presentation just makes it sound like it was, you know, created um, specifically for that intent. So I've got some cured meats, some of our cheeses. Um, I've got a really beautiful nut mix there and um, these nice toasts with some goat cheese, some garlic scape pesto and some cherry tomatoes. Um, so cheers to cocktail hour. Cheers to wine cocktails. And we look forward to seeing you all very soon. Have a very happy Thirsty Thursday.